sounding good, then this thing's probably doing better than it should because I don't sound that good. All right. So uh, I am, let me start off by saying that first, I am not a smoke reading instructor. I am a lifelong student and I am a thermal imaging guy. I spend most of my time reading about thermography, which is the study of remote measurement through non-contact means, uh, basically looking at things from far off and telling what you can learn about it. And what we're going to do is talk about what can we add to your decision matrix, if you will, by adding thermal data when you read smoke. There are lots of great people out there reading smoke. Uh, Rob Backer is a great instructor who's continuing on with the uh, Dave Dotson legacy. I am not that guy. I'm just somebody who really is passionate about you understanding that Mike was talking about something really important, temperature and heat. There's a difference. Uh, when you take a thermography class, the first bomb they drop on you is there's no such thing as true temperature. And you're like, what? So as temperature is a measurement related to something that's calibrated at a certain point. So I take a one candle could be 16, 1700 degrees. That's hot. But what about 1700 candles? They're the same temperature, but they're putting off a massive amount more of heat. And that's what Brother Daly was trying to teach us about energy. Energy is what we should be concerned about. One little spot of temperature that's hot can burn my finger, but thousands and thousands of points of those energy bullets going down the hallway and hitting us through convection and radiation, that's a different ball game. And we're gonna talk about what we see from the outside. Now keep in mind, this is a 16 hour class shoved at you in 60 minutes. So I drank a lot of coffee today because I was up all last night because normally that doesn't happen where I'm assigned, so hang on. So let's start with some interesting stuff to get your blood pumping. Why do you need to know this? Well, here's a few videos of things that may surprise you. See that coming? Before he opens this door, suspenseful moment here. What's going to happen when we give it air since Brother David was talking about it? This and 700 more videos like it are for your viewing pleasure at our YouTube channel. Please check it out. So just to get your blood flowing, Bobby, Bobby Kyle taught me that. He said, you always got to start with something to get everybody interested. What are we going to learn tonight? So hopefully we're going to talk about reading building construction through the eyes of a thermal imaging camera. You're like, why would we do that? Well, we'll get into it. Various building types, building components. Uh, Brother EJ, who's on here, is a phenomenal resource when we talk about building uh, infrastructure. I highly recommend you check him out. Uh, I'll let him plug his website later. Uh, doing some phenomenal work about stuff that most of us don't even have a clue on. So please check him out. And when we talk about reading smoke, we can do volume, velocity, density, color, but are we reading heat? Not temperature, but heat. People get hung up in temperature. And I'm going to tell you why that's dangerous when you're using something known as a qualitative device. And more importantly, what Brother Daly was telling us about heat transfer, energy, where it is, where is it going, based on the things he taught you about flow path. That is extremely important. When we watch this little video, I'm going to fast forward it to the back of this building here in Fairfax. And I want you to look at what you see is nothing showing versus through the eyes of this Bullard NXT, what you see coming out from underneath that seemingly innocent metal window covering on a burn building. I think it was built by NASA because this building could take anything. Look what's blowing out the bottom of that. Energy, heat. And that Bullard camera doesn't show colorization till 500 degrees. So you see that gray white moving stuff? That's convection currents, that's hot. The camera's got a little triangle in the upper left-hand corner, which is a dead giveaway that's trying to warn you you're near something hot. And we'll talk about that. Now keep in mind, we will not get into all the specifics of the camera, but we're gonna go through a broad overview in this ride here. So why do you need to know this? Hopefully, hopefully many of you are familiar with Don Abbott and his work, Project Mayday. Please check that out. Phenomenal resource. And one thing you'll learn is that we fail to do a 360 half the time. 
Uh, Brother David said, you know, I got my windshield view, three sides. A lot of time that fourth side is the killer. It wasn't my department. It wasn't numerous other departments. Uh, we got to make sure that we are taking time, or as Chief Mitchum says, save, take seconds and save minutes, because 50% of all May Day cited the lack of a 360. And many fire behavior indicators go unnoticed because we failed to include this one critical piece of important uh, component called thermal data. Mike and I speak the same language. We don't talk about feelings. We don't talk about opinions, at least not when we're presenting. We talk about facts, data-driven presentations. Everything we give you is based on data, research, line of duty desk, because I'm not smart enough to risk your life on my opinion. Uh, we we want to talk about how the fire transmits heat. Lloyd Lehman talked about that in the 50s, that we have to have a thorough understanding of how heat is transferred and how that influences fire growth and how we fail to use it or fail to notify or see it by using the camera. This particular fire after the fire is over, we have 45 minutes from the time we get a control time, which means the stopping the forward progress of the incident until we get zero readings in the building before firefighters can make entry and do overhaul. That's our cancer prevention program, so to speak. And one of the things I do in that 45 minutes is when I'm hanging around, I'm the tick weirdo. So I go around and look for somebody who's actually carrying the camera and I talk to them about it. And this company officer who's jam up, did a phenomenal job, did his 360, but I noticed he didn't use the camera. And they VES the front. He pushed through the front door to regain, rejoin his crew, but he pushed through fire to find the back stairs. And I asked him why he didn't know where the stairs was. And he didn't see it upon his 360. This is not his fault. My department doesn't push this training. So if you're a prophet and trying to share stuff and nobody listens, I feel your pain. So watch closely as we look at the Delta side of a type five construction building that's four to six inches thick, regular insulation, and see what you see. Where would the stairs be? You see them now? It's called thermal bridging, a fancy word for conduction or temperature differential. If I'm a building thermologist, a fancy word for a building inspector with a thermal imaging camera, all I need is 20 degrees temperature difference from the inside of your home to the exterior to do an inspection. And there's some other variables, daytime, you know, not middle of sunny, sunny time of day, all kind of cool stuff they have to do. But if they can do that and look for all kind of normal problems, we're looking for what's abnormal. And this is clear as day when after the fire's put out. What else can we see when the building's on fire? Well, Brother Daly is very familiar with this building. I worked for a year on this particular project and then fell through the floor in this house and never got to burn it, but they did. And this, this particular building, they got some phenomenal data out of Kill the Flashover. And this is one of my favorite shots. The front door is open. You're looking at the interior view through a Scott X380 camera. And you're looking at a upper right corner view of what Ed Harton would define as an incipient stage fire. I love what he calls an incipient stage fire. Anything shorter than him. I love that definition because, you know, we get into firefighter technical stuff and we just need to speak to the language that we all understand. But if that's an incipient stage fire, what about the amount of heat that you see moving upwards and across that ceiling towards what Brother Daly told you, an open front door that's seven by three Square, that's 21 square feet. That's bigger than your average vent hole at four by four. So what happens when we leave that open with close proximity of ventilation, high heat release rate fuels, as he told you about, and I leave it open instead of hitting it with water, controlling the door, all the things he talked about. We're taking those building blocks he gave you and we say, you know, I'm going to do my 360 and leave the door open. What happens 30 seconds later? I thought we vented for life. You sure did. You vented for the life of the fire. So there's some fi there's physics and then there's fire service physics. Fire service physics is Wiley Coyote. He runs off the cliff and all of a sudden he realizes, oh, gravity applies to me. And then he falls. We foolishly believe that we can get away with ignoring science. And as dad says, it's not if, it's when. It's going to catch up with us one day. We're racing physics and one day we're going to lose. So let's talk about what your tick is and what it isn't. Your tick does not measure smoke temperatures accurately. There's a lot of argument through the scientific community because it's technically not a gas. It's got particulate and aerosols and aggregates, but a fire service tick cannot quantify that exactly. So if I can't give you an exact measurement, I'm not going to tell you that. It doesn't measure gas temperatures such in hazmat, but you can see the effects of gases. It doesn't measure surfaces accurately when we talk about shiny surfaces, and it is not x-ray vision. However, 
as we see from this drone view, when we burn this house in Caddo Parish, Louisiana, we can see the smoke pushing out through here. So why can a tick see through the smoke? Because you're looking at long wave infrared radiation that passes through most smoke. And this is Brother Daly's favorite burn, one of his research burns at KTF. Now, long wave infrared radiation passes through most smoke relatively effectively, and the camera picks it up. When we start talking about smoke that's coming from something like a CrossFit gym with four tractor tires, mats, or we're in a you know, methyl ethyl death environment with maybe a tire manufacturing facility, your camera may not see as well and may not see very far. I've recently discovered that when you're dealing with spray foam fires, we teach everyone to wipe their face piece and wipe the lens of the tick because most firefighters don't know to do that. And the camera produces a screen similar to whiteout due to moisture. Well, in these basically spray foam fires, it produces an oily residue in the smoke that's like when you get bug guts on the windshield, it won't come off. So you wipe your face piece and it gets worse. You wipe the lens and it gets worse. So we found some new contraindications about a new enemy that some of you young guys and gals are going to be facing with spray foam fires, SIP panels, and e-bikes burning inside of a house, along with drywall that's also packed with petroleum now, thanks to the International Code Council pushing, oh, lightweight drywall. We'll make it lightweight and we'll put petroleum pellets in it. Did we not learn anything from our past with paneling and varnish stuff? No, let's just cover the whole house in gasoline, inside and out. But when we talk about thermography, what you're here to learn about, how it affects you and reading smoke and the building and everything in that environment, there's two types. Quantitative, like you're checking your kid's temperature. It's got to be darn near close because at 99, they don't go to school. 98.6, they can go to school. Whereas qualitative is what we have. Qualitative is we're looking for what's wrong. Anomalies, problems, defects. We're not looking at exact measurements. Your thermal imaging camera can be hundreds of degrees off. NFP 1801, the 2021 edition, remove the spot temperature from the startup screen. Why? Because firefighters have been killed and injured and rekindles have been reported because we treat it like a thermometer. I had one of the largest departments in the nation call me during COVID and ask if they could use their Bullard T3Xs to measure their, fo their firefighters' foreheads for fevers. Paul's deep breath. No, you cannot do that. That's how bad the thermal imaging education level is across the globe. I watched recently in the UK, they were filming a film on using lithium ion or fighting lithium ion batteries. And they were measuring the battery temperature from the outside with the spot temperature on an old antiquated tick. That's almost like wetting your finger and touching it. Uh, you're not going to know. So these things are basically looking for what's wrong. Okay. And when we talk about those types of cameras, there's two main types, as Brother Dale and I were talking at the beginning of class, that are being marketed here when I say that to you today. There's situational awareness ones and decision-making ones. One is designed for a specific context known as preventing firefighter disorientation. I'm in trouble. I need to find my fire, fellow firefighters, find my way out, get back on the hose line. That's what a situational awareness tick is designed for. There are defined limitations within that camera that you need to know. And some are better, some are worse. I'm not going to bash manufacturers or anything. You just need to know your devices. If you want more information on them, we can help you with that. We speak 75 different instruction manuals so far. That's my weird thing that I do is I read the instructions. Where we talk about decision-making cameras, they're like your really good TV. Higher resolution, faster refresh rate. They've got a lower thermal sensitivity. Most of them are intrinsically safe if they meet the NFPA standard. And they all have something known as interoperability. Green power button is always the power button. The symbols are the same. They do that so there's some uniformity there. And you can use them for size up, search, stream placement, and more. Don't use the situational awareness tick to try to do size up, fire attack. You can be injured, disappointed, or worse because it's lower resolution and it's slow. Some of them are nine hertz refresh rate. I've never met a patient firefighter in a fire, so keep that in mind. So here's why you don't mix them up. There's a K55 on the left and a FLIR K2 on the right. One's about $6,000 on the left. One's about 1,400 bucks. The one on the left is 80,000 pixels, which is still considered grossly low resolution in industry. But that's four times the amount of resolution as the K2 on the right. Look what you don't see in the K2. This is wet straw smoke after the fire's been extinguished, where you're wiping your face piece constantly, like you're searching above the fire and it stinks as far as visibility goes. I can see my instructor. I can see the, the, the blocks in the wall. I can see the outline of the doors. 
I can barely see anything with the K2. Why? Because it's 20,000 pixels. Pixels make a big difference. Trust me, go look at TVs, resolution matters. So you get what you pay for. So don't go buy some industrial camera, an automotive camera, or camera from the sporting goods store and try to use it in the fire because I've seen it. And a tick is not a tick. There's thousands of different models for different contexts. In my neighborhood, a tick is something to get stuck on your leg. A thermal imaging camera, however, varies depending on its context, who is it made for, and whose hands it's in. And NIST defined this back in the 90s when these things were made that there was something called the tactile use of ticks. I didn't come up with that. I just took all the thousands of pieces of information that I keep finding and try to complete the puzzle. And Brother Daly was part of that journey for me. So talk about size up, communication, search, directing hose streams, checking above you, overhaul, forensics even. Brother Daly is an arson investigator. I'm pushing for the arson investigator groups to start using radiometric thermal imaging cameras for investigative purposes. Why? Because they record each pixel as a temperature measurement, which is admissible in court. I don't see too many places doing that yet. The convection rate would go up. Uh, for, we were talking about wildland fires, very popular in UAS platforms and size up. Departments all over the country are using them. Hazmat, you can use it to look at fluid levels. In some cases, the effects of fluids or gases, but you don't see gases per se with a fire service tick. If you want to look at gases, you need to go study something called optical gas imaging. Those cameras start at $40,000 and go up to $2 million. And you have to have at least a level one thermography certification followed by an optical gas imaging certification followed, followed by a bunch of training before they'll even let you rent one. So I doubt they're going to let us hold one. And then you can use them from inspections and all kinds of other things. But let's address the elephant in the room. The first thing I want to talk about is we fail with or without a tick. And here's how we fail. We don't carry it 50% of the time. Brother Peter Matthews is on here. We did a wonderful survey in partnership with them and they discovered that most of firefighters are leaving it on the truck 50% of the time. We thought it was getting better. Unfortunately, it's gotten worse. We fail by training incorrectly. We use fake smoke and heat up victims and think that's how they're going to look in a fire. Mm, wrong it's background and body temperature. The background of the environment and the body temperature of the victim and the camera you're holding, whether it's in high or low sensitivity, determines that. We fail by reading the spot temperature instead of reading the overall environment. When you drive down a road, you don't look in the lower right-hand corner of the windshield. You look at everything that could hurt you. And that's what I want you to do when you use the camera. And keep in mind, the camera has a fixed, narrow field of view. You can miss things with a camera if you get tunnel vision. We fail to use it during size up and fire attack. We only use it for search and overall. I hear on the radio all the time, we're having trouble finding the fire. Send in the tick. Like it's gonna sprout legs and walk inside. I'm sitting there listening to the radio and I'm going, don't get angry, don't get angry. You know. We fail to wipe the lens. If you look at a thermal imaging camera, it has a lens on the front of it. That's its eyeball. It's like trying to drive in the rain without the windshield wipers on. It's not going to work. The screen will go white or gray. And I'll hear this. I went in six or eight feet. Then the tick went gray or white. It was useless. And I put it down. I say, well, tell me more. Usually they're standing up in a convective exhaust path and they never wipe the lens of the tick. Because I say, how many times you wipe your face? Oh, I was constantly wiping it. Well, the front of that camera does not have a windshield wiper on. If you don't wipe it with that dirty fire glove, you're not going to see anything. And we fail when we stand up and expect it to work. The germanium lens on the front of it is only rated for 400 degrees Fahrenheit. You heard it. Mike was talking about what number he was worried about and concerned about. Your camera's concerned about anything above 400, okay? We fail by not being educated and trained properly on it. And my personal favorite is we fail by stopping using it because we had a failure or a bad experience and we're never going to let that happen again. You're not going to hurt me again. Nope, not doing it. So those are some quick overviews. How can we use it and how can it help us? We can use it for assessing priorities for corrective action. That's what thermographers do. This is a simple little video of showing a clear K55 switching between search and rescue mode and TI basic. If we had about eight hours, we talk about just color palettes and application modes. This particular application mode we use early or late, single game, high sensitivity only, and it shows color at 200. Watch the difference. I see red on one side of the container, a yellow spot. I switch it back to TI Basic, which is the NFPA approved color palette, which this camera doesn't show color to 300 degrees. Tell me if that would be easy to miss because the movies lied to you. There's more than 50 shades of gray. 
There's a thousand color palette, thousand shades of gray in the color palette industry, 255 shades of gray in the average camera. The average human being can see 30 shades of gray, which is a female, and the only man can only see 10. This is why I'm not allowed to pick out colors. And if you're both pulling a hose line, you can only see four shades of gray. So colorization does matter, especially under stress. When you pull up to a stoplight, it's not three shades of red, it's red, yellow, green to get your attention. When we talk about key attributes of the tick, these are the things we spend a lot of time breaking down. How your camera sees the, the world, observable world in front of it, the field of view like your eyes do, application modes versus temperature modes, color palettes and resolution, a fancy word that no one can pronounce, even me, emissivity, and then distance to spot ratio. All this determines how the camera is going to see and interpret that along with the fancy programming they use along with software. If you don't understand these, we can't go any further. And I will gladly share with you a 30 minute free webinar that defines that. And we talk about things like changing our field of view using something known as the gangster grip. If you have a pistol grip camera, it is wider than it is tall as far as its orientation. When you drop to one knee entering a door, you turn it sideways, don't put it near the nozzle like we do here, you turn it sideways when you're down on one knee, you can now see the floor and the ceiling in one shot. Everybody told me to scan high, middle, low, but then they told me to look for life. Life's not on the ceiling. So I start low. I flip my camera sideways here in my office. I'm gonna come back to the exact same spot because I'm lazy firefighter standing up here and you tell me what I missed. My daughter, 13 degrees difference between vertical and horizontal with that camera and simply flipping the camera sideways gives you that 13 more degrees. It works well in long, narrow spaces, not big, wide open spaces, not during 360s and whatnot. This was, first I found this was in a PowerPoint from Carrollton, Texas in 1999, when I believe Bruce Varner was the fire chief. So I always cite where I get my stuff from. When we talk about how your camera sees, your camera does something that your eyeball does from high to low sensitivity. Your eye starts in a dark room where the pupil is dilated and when you see a lot of light, it constricts. Your camera does something similar. In low heat, your camera is in high sensitivity, which means it can see pretty well. And when it sees a lot of heat, it'll freeze for a second, which means you should freeze. A triangle will show up in the upper left-hand corner if it's a newer camera. And then in many cases, you'll see colorization. What you want to understand, though, is Brother Joe DeVito, since Mike quoted him in the last presentation, we're going to double plug him tonight. He says the following, if your tick changes modes, so should your tactics. If your tick is in high sensitivity, for the most part, you can stay high, meaning I can duck walk and get away with it for most cameras, not all. And if it switches to low sensitivity, I need to be low and doing something about it. Think about if I'm on one knee looking into a doorway and my camera switches to low sensitivity. In Mike's camera he was referencing, that means 2% of what's in front of him is at least 302 degrees apparent temperatures. That's an estimate. It's hotter than that. So what is that doing to a victim on the floor? He's already told you what the thermal couple readings they got from Kill the Flashover. It's much worse than we think. So let's pay attention to this thermal data inside and out. Here's an example of looking at the ceiling with Mike's camera and my, one of my cameras I use. It's in low sensitivity because of the triangle. When I come to the floor where I don't have the heat within the field of view, it switches to high sensitivity. The triangle goes away, so does the color. When I come back up to the ceiling, it freezes, Camera engages, triangle shows up, colors there. Watch when I let it play and I switch to gangster grip. Now I can see the whole thing in one view. Instead of a six-sided scan, I can do three moves and see the whole picture. It's a quick overview of that. He was talking about colors and flames. You need to know when your camera shows color. I wish that all of them showed color early and showed it well. They don't. NFPA did not fix that. TI basic is the recognized color palette, which means black, gray, white, yellow, orange, red is the progression in which it should show up from cold to hot, but they let the manufacturer pick when. And they say no more than 50% of the color palette shall be grayscale. Well, not all of them follow that rule either. So when does your show color? Does it show it in high and low sensitivity or only in low sensitivity? Does it show it early or late? The FLIR camera, he's mentioned it shows as early as 302 degrees. The Bullard shows it at 500 degrees. The Draeger shows it at 572 degrees. The MSA 6000 shows it in high sensitivity at 270 and then doesn't show it again until 1000 degrees in low sensitivity. 
Is that a big deal? You wait till you see color there, you're dead. So you need to know per NFPA 1408, all of what these things mean before you pick it up and go try to do a size up. And this is brother Mike's camera and one of the ones I used that shows you what these colors mean. The absence of color is not the absence of heat. Please remember that. You see gray white moving stuff, that was one of those heat transfer modes he was talking about that's really important, convection, it's bad. If that's moving, you need to stop it. Just like you talk about reading smoke, volume and velocity. I challenge you the next time you see slow moving smoke, look at the camera and see the velocity of the convection currents and see what you notice difference. The convection is moving faster in that image and you'll be like, oh, that's worse than I thought. The neutral plane is only 50%, but the thermal layer is to the floor. Oh, that's worse than I thought. We're not really giving the fire credit for how bad it is. And we kind of de-minimize it and say, eh, it ain't that bad. But then we're well protected and the victim's not. So you need to remember that. And when you talk about when your camera shows color, there are a lot of colorblind firefighters. So you better make sure your firefighters can see these things and know when it engages because that green triangle first means low sensitivity. And if you wait till you see color here, you're going to find out why it's too late. This is a phenomenal grayscale image from the Illinois Fire Service Institute flashover video. You see moving stuff over their head. What is that? Somebody would say smoke. Well, it's the heat within the smoke. We can't say exactly the smoke, but you're seeing the heat within the smoke. He told you that you'd see lean flashover around 1100 degrees. Don't ask me what the nozzleman's doing. I have no idea. Can't answer that. But what you'll see every so often above his head is a pulse or a flash, like lean fire gas ignition. Okay, if I'm reading the spot temperature here, I'm in trouble. That's not what you want to do. Pay attention to the big picture. It's in low sensitivity. I got fast moving gray stuff over my head. And then look at it getting faster, faster, faster. And all of a sudden I see a little bit of color, a little bit of color, not much. Still not paying attention because I'm moving hose, talking on the radio, guiding my firefighter, managing pinch points, two person hose line. You're the senior firefighter or crew leader. Still don't see anything and you're not paying attention to that stuff over your head, which is actually fire, or as the old heads used to call black fire. Sir William Herschel called it dark heat. Boom, yellow, orange, red. Red's a thousand degrees with a bullet. Do you want to wait? That's a reactive measure. Don't do that. See the heat, erase the heat. We don't pencil it, okay? So this is another example with the FLIR camera where you see it earlier. And you can see this walk into this room. I'm going to show you how it looks. Notice when we come inside this room, you can actually see image enhancement or details within the colorization. NFPA requires that if it's an NFPA 1801 certified camera, that you see details resolvable within the color. That's important. Now I'm going to enlighten you why here in a little bit. And this is why you should care what kind of camera you're using, because these are three firefighters with three of the same brand of camera, but different model at three different distances. And they had to be this close with the K2 for the camera to switch to low sensitivity. They had to be 15 feet away with a K33 before the triangle engaged. But they were 25 feet away with instructor John Lightly here, Chief Lightly, when the K55 engaged. More pixels, better decision making. So don't just buy any camera and call it good. That infuriates me. You know, you wouldn't buy something cheap or something at the house when you need something good. Well, fire departments are famous for doing that and then finding out later. That's not what it ended up being. And here's my personal favorite. Would you put your hand on the side of this box? 70 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Wrong. Emissivity is the single most important attribute in temperature measurement. Emissivity is the fancy word for what is this surface made of? Is it shiny or is it rough? The technical definition is the ability of an object to emit, absorb, or reflect heat numerically between zero and one. Most firefighters aren't gonna care or remember that until you tell them the following firefighter definition from chief kevin burns if it's shiny it will burn your hiney if it's rough you can trust it your camera's preset emissivity at 0.95 which is most carbonaceous objects which are wood soot human skin carpet ppe your couch see where i'm going with this but then there's a lot of shiny things too so if you read the spot temperature you're in trouble so you, you wouldn't put your hand on the side of a shiny pot when the water's boiling but your camera's going to tell you the side of that shiny pot is close to the room temperature because it's reflecting that energy back because it's a lower emissivity object, just like low E windows are. The other reason we get in trouble with the cameras, we do the following. We scan left to right really fast and think the camera's supposed to kick in, catch up. This firefighter misses 
the burn room. Notice when he does, it's eight seconds long. Keeps right on rocking. Anybody happen to notice when he missed the burn room or the fire room? It's a real structure fire. Let's do it again. Camera freezes. That's when we should freeze. Triangle engages. He kept scanning. Back it up right there. And then we went too fast. So what are we lacking here? Patience. It's a device and it needs time to switch just like your eyes. If you step out of a dark room into the bright sunshine, you go, ah, you have a startle effect. Most of these cameras take a second, sometimes a little less. And in this case, if you go from a cold room to a hot room, watch what the screen does. Firefighters would call that whiteout. Old cameras did that. New ones don't. Watch what happens a second and a half later. Freezes, screen goes white, triangle engages, and ooh, that room is warm. You don't have to be a level two thermographer like me to say that's hot. Okay. Look at the edges of my camera. They're turning yellow. That's bad. Okay, Mongo see heat, that's bad, right? So John Dixon, a good friend of mine and, and Brother Daly says, hey, we need some tactical patience here. Your guys and gals should move fast under your direction and you should be calm, cool, collective. As Aaron Field said, we should be like Marvin Gaye, smooth music, not Metallica, right? So look at, look at the difference in just a second and a half difference. Second and a half. And miss the fire room and bad things can happen. So let's talk about how this can, this whole mess of stuff I just spewed at you can be applied to the fire ground when we talk about size up and reading the building, reading smoke. First of all, it does not replace your fundamental building construction knowledge, period. If you're not getting out and looking at buildings and studying building construction and learning from wise people like Mike and other people that I respect, like Christopher Naum, who's a phenomenal building construction expert. He's got a web page called buildingsonfire.com. Check him out. Amazing, 40 plus years in the fire service and a licensed architect. He understands the anatomy and physiology of the building. Learn your buildings because you can't see through walls. You may see signs, thermal cues and thermal bridges or heat transfer even through windows, even though they told you you couldn't. I'll show you how. And then you can see things interior and exterior. This building had a parapet roof all the way around it. And then we walk inside and look up and it's like, uh-oh. That's a, that is a what type of roof? That's a bowstring truss. That was missed by the first due company officer due to the way the building was renovated. So size up is inside and out, not just what I see outside. Pay attention to what your crews are telling you on the inside too. And if you study Dave Dodson's program, we did a thing for the ISO thing where you added in thermography to it. You got reading a building, you got reading smoke. But when you talk about reading heat, and what does that mean? Because firefighters, I think, me personally, this is the only personal observation I'll throw at you, are more afraid of steam than they are of fire all day long. We'll let a building burn down, but we won't open the nozzle because we're scared of steam. And as Brother Daly taught you, steam is not the enemy. You know what? This is not new, not even close. We didn't even think to ask the experts when we started doing size up. They'd already do this for a living in other contexts. There's people called block wall thermologists, building science thermologists, electrical thermologists, energy loss thermologists. Brother EJ, there's HVAC thermologists you and I were talking about earlier today, industrial thermologists, residential thermologists, all who can check buildings out with a thermal imaging camera. Well, we're going to leave it on the truck only for search and overhaul. Do what? Oh, that's a liability issue. Have you read NFPA 1408? And have you seen what's going on in the courts today? They're taking us to court and making us look like idiots because we are in some cases. But it, person who's trained in this when the building's under normal conditions can look for electrical problems, air leaks in and out, construction defects, roof leaks. If you got rats in there or beehives, they can see that. Insulation voids, don't do that. You'll be mad. I walk around and look at my house and I can see there goes my money out that door, there goes my money out that window. Plumbing leaks, bad windows. There are window thermographers, you hear me? They look at glass and tell you if the argon gas has gone bad. And you hear firefighters go, well, you can't see through glass. You don't see through anything. You're seeing temperature differences of the surface. I read an article recently from a few years ago showed a fire department pointing the thermal imaging camera at the, at the lake and says, fire department uses new technology to look for drowning victims. I almost fell out of my chair. Can't see through water. It's an opaque surface. We don't read the instructions. We got to do better. So all this comes together in a concept that we develop simply meaning you do your 360, we want you to carry the camera with you. We want you to look at the building with your training, and then we want you to carry the camera 
to see what you can see. Do you understand what it's telling you first? Understand the why before you apply. So what okay? can you diagnose? Listen to this. 360, everything I just told you about and more, where's the fire and how bad is it? Does that matter to you as an incident commander and as a firefighter? It should, because our job is to save lives and property. So the sooner we get to the fire and put it out, the better. Possible victim location. First thing in the in the acronym LIP is life. We are to save lives and property if possible. So if I know where the victim is from the exterior and in the interior, I'm going to get to the victim. If you teach our search class, the research shows 70% faster. I'll show you a then enter search video here in a little bit. From the time he gets in, the time he's out is one minute. And that's getting and searching outside the door. Why? Because he had a guide at the window going, go here, go there. He's actually saying, go to your three o'clock, go to your five o'clock. Because we don't use go here, go there, go right, go left, zero visibility, because that doesn't work. We learned that the hard way. Our military brothers and sisters have got it figured out. We can learn a lot from people who are not in our profession who are doing some things that we are doing similarly. And that's why we took thermography concepts, industrial concepts, things from the military, and we put them into experientially relevant examples like you're seeing here so you can use them. We can learn the building configuration and layout. A, by reading the building, the windows, the doors. You should be able to be taught to do that in your basic building construction class. But we teach a concept called taking a quick look before we start our 360. And we take that quick look inside that front door and we learn, A, is this a neat three bedroom clustered bedroom plan? Or is this a split bedroom plan with hoarding conditions? Or is this a mess of a, a house with uh, a motorcycle lab, a motorcycle shop in the front living room? I don't know. Helps me with that. Helps me understand that, right? Do they have nine couches in their living room? That makes a difference. Building construction issues. I'm looking at an older home that's drafty and falling apart. Or something that's been chopped up and made into something it shouldn't be. Exposure issues. I showed you examples of that. Signs of structural integrity loss. You probably were taught this in your fire classes. When you start seeing the roof will sag, the pipes will grow. Well, guess what? Wood starts to break down between 300 and 500 degrees. If you're outside of the house with a thermal imaging camera at a good distance away, and you're in a low sensitivity mode, seeing colorization, seeing temperatures between three and 500 degrees outside in a lightweight construction building, what do you think is happening to the inside? What do you think is happening to the inside of that container when the bullard shows red at a thousand degrees and the outside is red? One of our friends, Jack McGovern's departments adopted a uniform language when they do their 360. They say, tactical 360 complete. I got high heat on the, the Charlie side of the structure. I got yellow on the camera. They all know what that means. They're speaking the same language and they're also expecting the orange man or worse might be red, as Mike said, at the end of that hallway. In that back side of that house and they're not squirt squirt it don't work they're going to flow water on this flow and go as he said so when we talk about this concept we want you to remember your trainings first standard signs up concepts apply what is your training experience and acronyms as he said earlier what does that tell you by looking at this building before i ever pick up a camera time of day weather construction the, the lack of upkeep you know, reading the smoke, all of those things. Look at that first. Look at primary egress points. Send your guys there and take a quick look. Why? Think about all the large life loss fires, active shooter events. Where did those people ran when they, when they panicked? They ran the same door they came in. Where are you and I going to run to in the middle of the night? We have a fire. It's going to be the weirdest exit drill in our home. We're going to run the opposite end of the house, get my daughter, and then run to the front door when there's a door six feet from hers. But we don't use that door that often. We use the front door. We're going to look at each division, whether you're one, two, three, four, or Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta. And we're going to scan low, middle, and high. Every other tick class teaches high, middle, low. We don't do that. We learned the hard way. You look up, you see heat. Mongo doesn't look down. You know what else we learned? If the camera switches into low sensitivity, when you look at the heat source, you lose discernible detail and you may miss an important factor, like a victim laying in the front yard. We check openings as we go. I might open that door quickly, look, and close it back. Do not leave it open and create a flow path problem. No one ever taught me, by the way, to check crawl spaces either. COVID taught us a lot, but COVID taught me a valuable lesson when we checked a crawl space in an apartment complex and found a family living under there. 
you don't know what you're going to find. And my dad's model here, he calls it now, next, future, past. When you get back to the front of that structure where you started, try to remember what it looked like on the camera when you started. 60, 90 seconds later, as, my, as Mike talked about, has the smoke changed? Has the colorization and the speed of the convection currents on the camera changed? What does that tell you about what's about to happen when I open that seven by three front door? I better be ready. I better not stand here and do my hair, you know, and put my gloves on with the uncharged hose line because the fire is going to take a deep breath. And by the time I'm halfway down the hallway, then I'm going to have that ni nice mixture he talked about. And it's going to light behind me. And as my father says, then your nozzle is pointing the wrong direction. But we check those access points for victims, fire locations, severity, and building layout. I got a crew looking through the front door while I'm doing my 360 if possible, bleeding the air out of their lining, flowing water down that hallway, cooling the front porch, cooling above them. You're like, why would you do that? Well, why would you check your pattern and flow water on Mrs. Smith's flowers when there's fire down the hallway and smoke over your head? We're going to take a quick look. Why not cool the smoke, cool the doors, and cool in there? Unless I want a cool picture for Brother Matthew's magazine when I'm pinned down on the front porch, when I open that front door, I need to know what I'm getting into. Look at this video here. The fire is on the opposite end. You'll see it down there. There's a bunch of orange, yellow, and red. And then we're going to look at the carport entrance. And we're going to take a quick look. Now I'm going to peek inside this door. I see a seemingly innocent white thermal layer because I'm farther away from the fire. But I want to look down the hallway. What do I see coming out that door? Convection currents. Salmon swims upstream. You're going to swim upstream. But in order for you to swim upstream, you need to send water ahead of you. So send water there and then follow this to the sea of the fire. And it's game over. Whether you're outside or inside, these cues can help you. Oh, by the way, my personal favorite, go back. Watch this. When I hit this right here, that is a single pane glass window. Why you see color coming through it? I thought you couldn't see through glass. You can't but you don't put single pane windows in your home anymore e either for a very good reason. They're not energy efficient. They don't have a low E coating on them. They don't reflect energy and infrared energy goes right through it along with your pocketbook, allowing the camera to give you more information. And pardon the rock music here, but this is a video from Kill the Flashover. We can read smoke. We can't read heat and temperature. See what you see through the eyes of the Scott X380 when we look up at the roof. Look at the door and the heat coming through the door and look at the smoke. Now look, the camera's in high sensitivity in the Scott X380. Watch what happens when we leave it pointed at that heat pushing out that gable. Change the medium, colors changed, turbulent smoke. Watch as I keep playing. camera just switched to low sensitivity. This camera has three modes, high, medium, and low. In order for it to do that, it had to see at least 450 degrees on the surfaces, on the surfaces of the gable. And all I ever hear from cameras is, or the firefighters is, I saw color. Well, what does the color mean? Mike taught you some valuable information about reading smoke and reading the color of the flames. You need to know what your camera means. There's one particular model or manufacturer out there, they have 39 different models from their inception to now. 39. If you memorized all 39 and when this one does what, when it shows color and when it, what, what detector it used, what's the distance to spot ratio? No, you don't need to do that. As Rick Lasky says, I won't, I'll get my saw chief, it'll crank. You need to know your camera and learn it well. No matter if you like it or not, if you like my department, you're stuck with it, better learn it because it'll help you. This is important for you to realize because as Mike taught you, this smoke is getting closer to what? It's ignition point, right? So this all comes down to one really simple thing though. In order for us to be able to recognize what's wrong, we first have to know what's right. And if you don't think this is important, I've made some critical mistakes looking at what I thought was a heat signature when it was just a normal heat signature. There's things like solar loading, uh, uniform heat signatures from something being evenly heated, that comes from practice, training, experience, and knowing where to look and what to look for. So this is an example of solar loading and a balcony style or podium style construction where I used to work, spent seven years touring these buildings 
in one story of concrete, five to seven stories of wood frame, you know, basically giant lumber yards. We didn't learn anything from the 1600s about conflagration, but anyways, the sun is beating down that siding and look at the heat radiating off of it. It's nice, smooth, and uniform. That's called solar loading. It's a uniform heat signature. That's normal. So how do I know what's not normal? I have to get look at those two and understand normal versus abnormal by learning things like this. This is a building across from where I used to take my van to get service. This is what William Mora calls a firefighter killer building. In his book, Preventing Firefighter Disorientation, he tells us that this type of building should throw a red flag. There's two entrances, a roll-up door and a door on the other side. Everywhere I see shaded areas is where there used to be windows, and now there's new brick. And you can see where the building's been added onto and changed because that's different density, different R values, different absorption rates, and it shows up as shadowy effects. How do you think this is going to perform under fire conditions when I can go by and take my finger and put it on the mortar and it falls out in my hand? That's not good. So learn this before you commit. Go out, instead of sitting all day in the recliner, go out and look at your buildings. I don't want to hear about, oh, we're the best we are. We're the best ever. And we don't even know what building we're going to. Because the military thinks we're crazy because we go into buildings with a four to six minute head start on it. And they drill on it for six months and know every way out and plan B through Z. And we don't even have a plan A. And this is an example of solar loading. This is a drone flying over some houses that are heated nice and evenly from the sun. You also see some heat signatures on the ground because the ground absorbs heat too. So how does it look on your camera? Do you know? Have you went out and looked at buildings? Are you doing pre-plans? Well, take your camera with you. You never know what you're gonna find. I've got examples of departments where they happen to look at three houses in the evening and this one house was lit up white. And I mean, white, white hot. That's because they had some illegal stuff going on in it. And they called the boys in blue and changed things. Uh, you know, You never know what you're gonna see. It's a great learning experience. But this is an example of not solar loading. This is uh, Brother Mike's research project from KTF. You can see the uneven heat signatures coming through the shingles. You can see the heat coming out the window, convection currents coming out the Bravo gable there. And then from a construction standpoint, I can see the differences in roofs from shingles to uh, sheet metal, to the ridgeline vents, to the chimney, to the gables, all the things I need to know. So if you don't think drones are gonna be the next thing, I'm sorry, we're already behind. Uh, numerous departments are already there and you're going to see BC buggies with little tether cords and drones going up and giving you this information. I'm sure we'll make a lot of mistakes as we're learning, but that's what we've done. The concept we're going to discuss that helps you see some of this stuff is pretty simple. It's a fancy word for conduction. It's called thermal bridging. All it is, is when we talk about engineers and when they build buildings, they want to eliminate this. They want to put in insulation and energy stops to prevent energy from going from the interior to the exterior. Your home has to be energy efficient, for example. So before they hand their keys to you, when you bought your house, they pressure test it. And anywhere it leaks, they seal it with caulk, spray foam, and rubber gaskets. How does that stuff perform under fire? Not so great. So the building's weakness under fire becomes our strength, such as how many buildings are made of metal when you talk about I-beams. Well, metal heats up really fast and transfers energy really fast and tells me in these little arrows, like a state test, you might want to pay attention to this, where I might need to check to take my line to. You know, everybody says, so goes the first line, so goes the fire. Did anybody ever think that that started with a good size up? Because a bad size up leads to bad line placement too. So if the area, the building has a weak thermal insulation area, that's where I'm going to see the fire transfer energy to get my attention. And most firefighters would fail to pay attention to seemingly innocent little white non-uniform heat signatures. They're called thermal bridges. And every building you look at has an area for these to occur, whether it's the roof, the walls, the windows, the doors, uh, EJs especially, where it's HVAC, plumbing, chimneys. Floors even can have thermal bridging, even though the floor, the structural integrity study shows us we can't see through floors, I'm not looking to see through the floor, but there's a lot of things I can see if I know more about what I'm looking at than what I'm looking through. Because this didn't do any tests on double wide mobile homes either. Okay, there's always a variable. I love the words always or never. So watch out because there's always something that'll surprise you. Like he was talking about dynamic flows. You want to watch out for that. When we talk about those thermal bridging areas, it could be connections. You could have veneer ties in the brick. 
It could be beams, columns, gusset plates, cables, tie rods. You could be any of that. You could look at infrastructure, HVAC that's got metal ductwork, uh, your power areas, uh, your reinforcements. Trusses can be a thermal bridge. I can show you that. All of those are places where you can look for abnormal heat sinctures where the problem might be. And if you think there's a shortage of places that can occur, just look at all the ones we found in this simple little construction diagram of the parts of a home exterior made simple. There's nothing simple about this house. The cupolas, uh, skylights, mushroom vents, powered attic vents. And by the way, that PVC pipe coming out, if you look at older homes like mine, you might have cast iron. So that's a different ballgame. Gable vents. What about uh, solar panels? What about bay windows? What about crawl space vents, dryer vents? Everywhere they poked a hole in your house is an opportunity for heat transfer. And I'm sure every time they put a hole in something, they come back and they put caulk or foam around it in some of your commercial occupancies. Sure they do. So there's an opportunity for that heat transfer to show up enough so to pay attention for us to say, this is where the fire might be. This is the back of a strip mall. And we take industrial thermography concepts and look at the metal eye beams and then the brick in between. If you're gonna breach this wall and you rear back with that fire mall and hit that metal eye beam, you go into the dentist because you knock your teeth out. You can see where the, the actual uh, scupper drains are telling you the height of the parapet wall. You see where the utilities are. In this case, I saw a, uh, looks like a dumpster, but it's for grease. You can actually see the amount of grease that's in it. You can see all kinds of stuff if you take the time to look. But if the camera's still in the charge of the truck, not gonna happen. More importantly for us, if I'm about to make entry onto this building. I don't think I wanna open this door with my nozzle closed. I'm gonna cool this area, have my line chars, mask on, ready to go as Brother Daly said. I wanna look for these thermal bridges, signs of fire, severity of fire, unknown fire spread. You can see the same thing in knee walls. So what do you think it looks like behind this door if I got these seemingly innocent little white stripes and non-uniform wispy convection currents coming around this door? Uh, bad. Yeah, charge. My dad says we have a sequencing problem. We want to shove our bodies into the fire instead of sending water, right? I got news for all my trucky brethren who I love. Your PPE does not put out fires. Water does. Truckies save engine companies, but engine company guys put out fires. Unless you're on the confused truck like Brother David was talking about, you do both. But we need to send water into that. Not my Globe fire decks or Lion or whatever gear we're wearing into it, right? Send water ahead of you, as he taught you, to make things better, right? And then when you look at things like this, before I open this door, before I do anything, this is a residential door, around the upper half of this door and through the peephole, it's lit up white. And then if you notice in the upper left-hand corner, the vent is lit up white. This is an enclosed space before you enter towards the burn building. I want you to see what happens they're going to cool the door and they open it. And what comes out when we're three rooms away from the fire and why KTF, people overseas and my organization all advocates, I'm going to cool the gases over my head and cool this door, check my pattern. I'm going to flow my nozzle, by the way, at least 10 seconds because you can't check, set your pump pressure if you just open and close the nozzle. That burns me up when I see that because you're going to go down the hallway with a limp hose line because they didn't set it right. Cool it, cool it, cool it, and inert the gases, as Lars says from Swedish Fire Nerd. And then we're going to open the door, but what should you expect and how should you open this door? How about I, open, I stay behind the door in case the orange man comes out? What do you think is going to come out? Not flames, but heat. Looks like ocean currents. Bullard has some beautiful convection currents on their camera rolling across that ceiling. Okay, that's the temperature change from the inside to the outside. Inside there, you see white hot. The average firefighter, if they're waiting on color with this camera, too late. I need to understand if it's white, I got to paint it black, cool it until it drops in temperature sufficiently, and then I move, right? It's not, not uh, hit and sit, as Brother Daly said. This concept we're teaching you has some strengths and some weaknesses. Here's your strengths. I can detect thermal bridges, identify where the fire is. I can identify or aid, aid engaging thermal severity, possibly identify survivable space, which also can tell me where the fire might go if I open doors or vent wrong. And I can use it to predict that fire growth, but it cannot see through walls. It cannot be used to accurately gauge structural integrity or structural integrity loss. It darn sure can't see through floors. It doesn't read temperature accurately on anything unless it's in an air conditioned warehouse at 70 degrees when it was calibrated 
By the way, most of them are off by a minimum of five to seven degrees from the factory, some as much as 41 degrees, and that's in an air-conditioned warehouse, not where we work. So the strength is I can see where the problem may be, where the problem is going. You know that acronym, another one, BAG, been at, going. Where's it been? Where's it at? Where's it going? I can see some of that, but I'm not going to see it if I don't know how to use my camera, I don't know what I'm seeing, and I don't even carry it, and you're supposedly the designated adult. So what to look for, I showed you this in the beginning where you saw the staircase and you saw the actual joist spacing. Look for unusual features, look for areas where thermal bridging could occur. Look at stairs, heating units, generators on commercial buildings, elevator rooms. Valuable knowledge when I'm looking at the building's normal thermal footprint and then also in abnormal conditions. And know your camera, do you know it's application modes? Those are different than temperature modes. Application modes are context driven. Like this camera has five different ones you can choose from. I'm not a big button fan because under stress at 170 beats a minute, I lose the ability to do a lot of things like push buttons, rational thought, auditory exclusion, all kind of bad things happen. So I don't like them making things more complicated when we're in a very high stress environment. But if you have an investigative mode and a fire attack mode, I like those two because we, we, let's be honest, we run more smells and bells and odors than we do fires. And if you had an investigative mode, like FLIR has a search and rescue mode, Bullard has an electronic thermal throttle, Drager has a thermal scan, numerous other ones. Argus has a size up mode that can help you see temperature and heat early instead of late when you're laying in the bed going, man, I hope we found that. And then three hours later, doo -doo -doo -doo, the house you went to is now on fire. You will have two days off to think about it. because That's what I get. So make sure you understand what your camera is seeing and how you can use those features to help you. And I hate to tell you this, but Mike's not the only one gonna give you another acronym. So we're gonna learn Mitch and we're gonna learn stick. So I guess we're gonna stick to Mitch if we look at it because stick kind of comes before Mitch because I need the surfaces and Mitch to put together. So stick is a simple acronym to help you with what you're seeing with the camera. And the camera is all about surfaces. What am I looking at? Is it brick, metal, wood, all of that? What kind of temperatures or heat am I looking for? Look for abnormalities. Is this a well-insulated building or a very poorly insulated building? That makes a big difference on where I'll see heat. And what kind of cues am I seeing thermally, like you see on this window and this college dormitory door where the rubber gasket around the door is fail? And lastly, and most importantly is, what kind of camera are you holding and who's holding it? That's the most important part. If I'm holding a high resolution camera and highly trained hands, got a good chance at it. I'm holding an antiquated, old, low resolution or situational awareness camera. Good luck. Wish you the best because I'm not going to see as much. When we talk about services, think about what you can see and what you can't. This example of vinyl siding, is it masonry? Is it wood? Is it metal? Is it a combination of that? How does it affect what the tick sees? And also, how does the environment, like summer, winter, Brother Mike's area gets a lot worse winters than I do. You can have high winds can cut your temperature measurements by 50%. Because what does high winds do to a building? It's called evaporation or cooling, right? And then when we talk about areas of interest, you see buildings like this under normal conditions, it's not going to get better under fire. It's not. Because if you hit this with a straight stream and a defensive op, it may not work out well with anybody in close proximity. I want you to look at this video from a third alarm fire we ran in a very similar building. It's in search and rescue mode, which shows color early. Watch, I'm assigned to the Charlie division when I walk around the Delta side and tell me what you see coming through the bricks right there. Those are your stair step cracks and there's moving white stuff pushing through an eight inch thick wall. Eight inch thick. This is the exhaust end. The intake side is down this way, Mansard style roof. Watch what happens when we walk around the back. This is one of those, uh, what we call a humbler fire humbles you. Look at those heat signatures. The fire is actually burning between the original roof and the four foot plenum space between it and the next roof. They're inside saying they can't find it. They got nasty smoke. Those are good things you want to hear on the radio? No. See this bricked up door right here with the heat coming through it? So they're all bad signs. Highly reinforced, like Mike said, re, uh, got bars on every window. This went third alarm just because of all of this. This is information that's valuable. You know, I told them to come check the back and we ended up working in this area where we found it, but they had to cut and cut and cut before they got to it. 
like I say, where's your no fear sticker now? This is not an inch and three quarter, have some fun, put it out. They were here for hours, okay? Is it wood siding? Brother Mike, I think you'd like this picture because it shows a value of the image enhancement on the FLIR camera you use because you can see the bars on the windows through the flames and through the heat. Standard infrared camera don't do that. But wood sided structure shows signs of heat quite well due to the porous nature of it. But as I said in my little size up video, wood starts to deteriorate around 340 degrees. Everybody told me, hey, gusset plates fail at 500. Well, it doesn't matter if they ain't got anything to hold on to. Have you looked at a two by four lately? They're harvesting these poor little trees when they're teenagers, barely. And you're looking at gaps between the growth rings that are fairly wide. They're not close together. These trees grow fast and they harvest them young and they burn just as fast in many cases as some of our lightweight construction components do. So we don't have a good environment when it comes to the building when we're talking about fire. So wood starts to break down a lot earlier than the darn gusset plate does. Look at this picture from Kill the Flashover from KTF West. You see fire coming out this far corner and then you see the actual heat coming from the Argus camera and the convection currents coming out of it. Uh, they put this fire out with a 20 GPM fog nail piercing nozzle through the roof. So the examples of what you see with the eye versus what you see with a camera. Uh, this is an example of when the fire is put out and the guys and gals are inside working and asking me, how does it look from the outside? Well, I have it in search and rescue mode. What do I see at the top of this beautiful 1920s craftsman style building that unfortunately burned three times before they tore it down due to our uh, homeless problem in this area? You see heat coming through that gable area where it's custom woodwork that you don't see anymore. So we had to open up that area because if I see it that much where I'm at, where is it where they are, right? So these are signs that the guys and gals inside can't see. As a good IC, your role is to make those laps periodically and look. If you're a RIT officer, if you're a safety officer, you should be doing 360s and looking for these things, okay? And that picture I showed you earlier, wood siding, this is Chief Lightley's department. This is a wind-driven event. I want you to look really closely and think about what Brother Daly taught you a little bit ago about Mitch movement, for one. Look at that. And I want you to look at the color of smoke, and I want you to look at the second floor alpha windows when we walk up. That look bad? Okay. He's going to walk up, and then he's going to put the camera down. In that 10 seconds that he puts the camera down, I want you to look at the windows when he comes back. Look right here again. I, I went too fast on the button here. I want you to look at the windows right I'll check the here. back. That window that was just black smoke is now full of flames 10 seconds later. Look at the other window. Fire. Interesting. We can read smoke, and that smoke tells us something. And the camera tells us something even more important. Look. Look at this. This is what it looked like before it lit off. See all the yellow on the wood, the surface temperature? See the red coming through the windows on the front, second story windows where there was no visible fire initially. That's 1,200 plus degrees surface temperatures emitting through those exhaust ports. He told you what happened at 1,100 degrees approximately. Can we predict this? What did John Taylor say? Fire is predictable. I like to add people are not. This is not something we should be surprised by. Okay, this is bad things happening. You know, I asked somebody what can they could tell from the size of they said they have direct TV. They can see the satellite dish, but that's typical firefighter humor, right? So what else can we learn from things like this? We can learn a lot. But I want you to understand that even though we don't have time to go through all the things tonight, I want you to think about when you look at all the stuff that you're dealing with from a size up perspective, think about the building envelope, whether it's vinyl siding, which is 35% of all homes in the United States, which are supposedly non-flammable. If you want some fun information, look up low E window home fires where this house is getting hit by sun and it's reflecting the energy on this house over here melting the non-flammable siding and burning the house down. It softens between 140 and 165 and starts on fire at 200. Look up the Scorchy Tower in the UK. They built a 20 plus story high rise out of low E glass 
and it melted bumpers off of cars in the parking lot, burned people on the first day. They didn't think about a concave shaped 20 plus story building made of low E glass and what the sun would do. We got a bigger problem when we go green than we realize. I showed you this small video of this earlier, but look at this vinyl sided view through the eyes of the camera. It's not x-ray vision, but you're seeing a lot. What are you gonna do with this data? Are you gonna take it and translate it into information that can influence your incident action plan and make things better on the fire ground? Or are you just gonna take this stuff and say, yeah, it's just a camera. I can only see, what'd you say, Mike, it's the fire gun. There's a lot of things you can see if you start to understand the patterns, the signatures, the colorization, just like this garage door that he showed you that great video of the intake and exhaust in one part and the door next to it was literally shaking from the pressure pulsating. And here I can see thermal bridging coming through this insulated door, supposed insulated, of what's behind this. So I wish I had a lot more time with you. I would go on and on and on, but then you would be like, it's midnight here, it's time to go to bed. But I want to stop and have some questions with you about what can we do with this knowledge? When you take smoke reading, you take the thermal imaging use, and you take all of it and put it together, what do you plan to do with it? Because my number one question I'll ask you is, are you gonna carry the camera during size up? And are you gonna go learn your camera first? And hopefully you're gonna spend some time about reading smoke and fire behavior and go to places like killaflashover.com and learn from the best fire behavior experts out there. Because if you don't understand building construction, you don't understand fire behavior, the thermal imaginer is not gonna help you.